So I want to bring the panel up. Uh, we're, we're now going to pick up on a lot of the threads that Nancy has just uh, sort of uh, put into the fabric or something. Um, and uh, continue the discussion of big picture here, uh, what it all means, where it's all going, what some of the big new opportunities are going to be. An extraordinary group of people up here. I'll, I'll quickly introduce them, and then I'm going to talk to them uh, in a variety of ways here. But starting here, Floyd Romsberg has been in the news a lot. He uh, recently created a new kind of life that could never have existed on the planet before by adding uh, what he called the X and Y element to the D language of DNA and got a, uh, a E. coli cell to reproduce. So that's a pretty big deal, and I'm going to ask him a little bit of uh, what that means in a second. He's at the Scripps Institute in uh, San Diego. Uh, next, Stuart Brand, who, uh, as I said, is sort of a spiritual father for us, a taconomy of many things. But certainly, uh, he's got a lot to say about a lot of things we've been talking about today. And uh, you, you heard uh, he's very involved in the Revive and Restore effort, but also the Long Now Foundation. Um, <clears throat> and. Uh, has been thinking a lot about biotech as a transformative force in society. Um, then, uh, okay, you're Jim, sorry. Jim Flatt of Genovia. I talked to you on the phone, but I didn't ever look at you, sorry. Uh, Jim Flatt okay. is the president of Genovia Bio, which is one of the divisions of a company called Synthetic Genomics. Uh, he is in the commercialization <clears throat> side where they're taking um, bio processes and applying them to the production of fuel, food, uh, chemicals, and other things. And he'll tell us how that works a little bit in, in more in a minute. And finally, Steve Levine of Dassault Systeme is the a director of Simula, which is a product of a company, Simulia, sorry. Thank you. I got to say it right since I, I said Dassault Des, Des Systeme correctly. Yes. But, um, uh, which is a, a simulation product that really allows for the more rapid development of biological compounds and, and products. And I want to hear in detail how, how that's going to apply. So basically what we want to talk about is the big picture. But I, I want to start with Floyd and, and ask you a few questions about your work. Because for this audience, first summarize in your words what you did. Um, oh, OK. So uh, if you'd start just very briefly, um, basically, uh, all of life's information, I think everyone here knows this, is encoded in four letters of the natural genetic alphabet. That's in the DNA, the GCATs. That's why it's these long strings that are then, is, and that's how information is stored. It's retrieved then by conversion of, of segments of that we call genes into something called mRNA. And the mRNA is read in a series of triplets of three nucleotides of GCA or whatever. Uh, and those code for amino acids, and that's what goes into proteins. And so what we did in my lab was um, get two artificial, unnatural nucleotides to form an unnatural base pair, call it X and Y. I actually never called it that, the literature, the, the, the media kind of. You never called it that? Oh, what my God. I will, I, 5, 6 NAM. That's, 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 well, that does, that's why the media had to help you, man. Come on. No help. Um, so we can, we can call it, it X and Y. It sounds good to call it X and Y, so here. keep going there. Um, and so what we got is what we, 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 found, we found an X and Y, an unnatural pair of nucleotides that formed an unnatural base pair that um, once we got them into E. coli and put them into the DNA, the cells stably harbored and replicated it and stored it. So they literally survived and, and grew and lived with, um, with DNA with increased information. And so what does this mean? I mean, give us the big picture implication from your point of view. Uh, the big picture implication, uh, well, I mean, I guess there's, there's a couple. There's like, is, like we talked on the phone, there's a conceptual sort of aspect of, of a big picture where I think a lot of people, I mean, the fundamental question in biology is why life evolved the way it evolved and why we are the way we are. And I think the, the most fundamental aspect of what we are is the information we store in our DNA and how we store that information. And I think for a lot of times, there were, uh, for a long time, there was this, uh, this idea maybe that GCA and T were there because everything in life has that. So let me be clear about that. Everything in the in universe, life, possibly, e yeah. Everything that we know, all life that we we know, and in fact, all life as far back as we can see that the last common ancestor of all life on Earth had a four-letter base pair of GCA and T, and that's how it encoded information. And so there was this possibility that maybe GCA and AT were the only solutions that were possible. There's something very special about those uh, nucleotides and those base pairs, G pairs with CA pairs with T. And what we've shown in my lab is that that's not at all true. And in fact, the X and Y pair by a completely different physical mechanism 
and, and they're completely different than GCA and T, and yet they function alongside with them just fine. So I think that from that perspective, it, it, it tells you that that um, that, that there, evolution's a lot, that life is a lot more plastic maybe than, than we thought. Um, the other perspective, we've, we've talked a lot about therapeutics today. Therapeutics, protein therapeutics have become a, a real big deal lately, and um, uh, people have become really interested in that, but they're very much limited by the 20 natural amino acids that you can build proteins out of. So if we can encode and retrieve and maybe even evolve proteins with 21, 22, 25 uh, amino acids, multiple unnatural amino acids that were selected for their possessing certain properties that bestow the proteins with certain functions that you'd be interested in either for a therapeutic goal or degrading, you know, fixing nitrogen or reducing carbon dioxide or whatever it is that you want, maybe you could then evolve proteins that, that function to do that. That's pretty exciting. Um, and I, just one final thing, you know, one of the things, and maybe anybody can chime in on this, although I want to get to each of you to some degree individually, but you know, we've heard a lot today about two fundamental technology processes, which is sort of reading DNA and synthetic biology as sort of two gigantic sort of freight trains of progress that are underway. Would it be your hope that basically you've identified something that is maybe a third kind of thing that could yield to all kinds of potential innovation and, and progress based on truly artificial life that would be another, is that sort of what you're hoping for? No, no. no. Um, what we're hoping for is, that we'll, and what we worked very hard to do was to make X and Y so that it can function along with G, C, A, and T. So we don't want to perturb, in fact, I think this is sort of, I mean, Just a more complex form of synthetic biology. Well, know? it's an expanded form. So it, it doesn't mess up what things do, what life does, but it increases the potential for what it might do. <coughs> And I think that, it's in, that that's important because we're a long way off from having a fully synthetic cell. Uh, in fact, I'll say long enough that it's essentially infinitely far off. Um, it's just too complex. But what we've been able to do is simply take the system that is there and add a synthetic component to it and expand the potential of what it could maybe be, be, be uh, uh, what it could do and maybe be, be uh, evolved to do. But when you said synthetic proteins that consume carbon, I saw Stewart's uh, eyes perked up there, because that's something he's thought long and hard about, uh, along many other things. But certainly, we all think about that. Let's face it, if you could come up with something that helped with that, we're, we're with you on that, right? Wait, I got an even deeper question. Okay, for please, you. ask him a deeper <laughs> question, Stuart. You're saying that GCAT, the, the DNA that life, life we know is based on is a frozen accident. There were these four that base pairs that happened to be the basic ones, and because they're that basic, you can't fuck around with them. And so everybody's stuck with them, but they just happen to be what happened three point something billion years ago. And it could that have been would, this other combination. I mean, so the two extremes are is that it's an accident that we all got locked into, mm -hmm. or that it was the only solution possible. And so what we've shown is that it's not the, that, no, let me be clear. We've shown that G, C, and T are not the only solutions possible because okay. we now have X and Y. Um, we, we do not have uh, an organism that propagates based on only X and Y. Right. So we haven't replaced the code in any way. All that we've done is expand it. Do you conjecture beyond X and Y? Are there other possible base pairs? Do you think this is it? Look, my lab, my lab spent 15 years doing this, so I'm, I'm now going to move on to these other aspects that we talked about. But mm -hmm. what I will say is that if you think about it, 15 people with essentially, we've talked a lot about funding, but this was one continuous NIH grant from, uh, from, from the government mm -hmm. um, and uh, that I got when I started my lab in 1990, oh God, anyway, a while ago. You told NIH you wanted to find a new base pair? Yeah, and they funded it. But wait, you finish your statement. So you're saying if you... So, so if my lab could do it in 15 years with no more than three, maybe four people working on it at a time, my guess is that there's lots of other solutions out there. Plenty it's of nothing, other ways It's to nothing do it. magic. Ah. It's just underlying fundamental forces of physics and physical chemistry and yeah. you know, the physical chemical properties of matter. You, any, any force that you can ha harness that's stable and selective that mediates the pairing of X and Y and A and B and, a and C and D and G and C and A and T, might be sufficient. We, okay. ha we happen to use a force called the hydrophobic effect. Okay, Jim, I see you nodding extensively. What, what, what's going through your head with this? Well, I'm, I'm struggling here in terms of uh, thinking about the, um, uh, the evolutionary advantages mm -hmm. that would uh, give us our current four base uh, genetic code and you know, kind of Floyd's thoughts on uh, with a different type of chemistry, hydrophobic uh, uh, association is, or interaction as opposed to uh, uh, hydrogen bonding. Uh, what you think the uh, uh, evolutionary advantage for the, the current kind of chemistry is and what the implications might be for evolution? 
so the reason that we chose hydrophobic nucle nucleotides in the first place to, so that they would pair with each other based yep. on oil and water of get, so I mean everyone knows that if you mix oil and water, if you like mm -hmm. salad, that they, they don't mix, they form two phases, and so water likes water, and oily like compounds like oily like compounds. So the natural nucleobases, G, C, and T, are all, as you mentioned, they, they, they interact based on hydrogen bonding, and so that's a very hydrophilic water-like thing. So we thought from the very beginning that it might be difficult, that we wanted to avoid mispairing with G, C, and T, so we made the very hydrophobic analog. So from that perspective, it might be very hard to make multiple hydrophobic base pairs. Yeah. Um, and so uh, maybe from an evolutionary perspective, if you need more than two, maybe hydrogen bonding was a, a much better way to go, and maybe that's why nature, nature went that route, because it was viable. But um, it, for the, in terms of the expansion, um, uh, one hydrophobic pair w was, was what worked, and maybe, maybe another hydrophobic pair would be, would be challenging. Okay, just we can come back to this, yeah. but I, it's not work. This is so cool. We could stay on this it is also. Very cool. uh, but uh, Stuart, I wanted you to just answer a kind of big picture question, since I, this is our big picture session among other fun functions is playing. Uh, how big? When I, if I wanted to just ask you, how big a change is biological science going to create in society in coming years, in your view, and 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 why? And in two minutes. We don't know yet. Um, the inklings are huge. You know, we get a sense that, okay, these self-accelerating technologies like digital technology, if they keep on doing it decade after decade, change everything. We saw it with communication technology, basically, with, with digital code. So now we're looking at biocode. Is biocode the same or is biocode different? In some ways, it's the same. It is, you know, absolutely minuscule little distinctions, uh, which when read as code and played out, make huge differences that can be evolved upon and expand in all directions. On the other hand, all the digital code that we know and work with is engineered. And almost none of the biological code that we work with is engineered. So you can't reverse engineer what was never engineered in the first place. It's kludges and patches all the way down three point something billion years of mess and trying to uh, tease engineerable order out of that is in a sense what Drew Endy was saying, you know, they're just trying to make biology engineering, engineerable because right now it ain't. The thing which drove Moore's law and that Gordon was right about from the beginning is that uh, there was a pattern of making fewer of chips having more and more transistors, basically, every year and a half, two years. Is there anything really equivalent to that in biotech? I'm not sure yet. I mean, for sure, DNA is incredibly tiny. We're just finding out uh, amazing new things that might be done with it, with this. Uh, and you know, there's big numbers down in there. People have three billion base pairs. The passenger pigeons we're paying attention to have 1.3 billion base pairs. We now have tools like CRISPR, Cas9, that can make individual changes at the base pair level. And I'm still getting my head around how indescribably, nearly invisibly teeny and tiny that is, that you have these huge differences that come out of it. So then what you're speculating about is how does the amplification play out over time of the law that hasn't been named yet of the self-acceleration of biotech? Medicine drives it. Uh, people want to stop being so sick and impaired and would like to live longer and thrive better and be smarter and all these things. And there's a lot of money there. So, you know, with de-extinction, we're just drafting behind the kind of money and the kind of technology that George Church and others are doing basically in, in service of human medicine. That desire, that need is in place and will be there, I guess, in some form indefinitely. So that funding, that market, that whatever that thing is that is drawing this technology toward it is absolutely in place, same way it was for digital technology. So the prospects are enormous. Whether it levels off in some way technically, I've sense some of the panelists here may have an idea on that. Um, so it's very, biocode is very simil similar to digital code and is fundamentally different. 
The other fundamental difference is where one is about communication, the other is about <coughs> life itself. You know, who we are. Not just how we talk, but what we're actually made of, how we grow. I'm reading a book called Life Unfolding, uh, How the Human Body Makes Itself. And it's, you know, I studied biology 50 years ago over here at Stanford, and I had no idea of the profound simplicity and subtlety and complexity <coughs> that an embryo goes through in the process of development, any embryo shrimp for us, but we are now grasping that complexity, are able to model it, and big data and better modeling and all this kind of stuff is giving us a handle on things which always seemed impossibly complex before, and probably including ecology, which has not been a predictive science until now. That's where I live. So yeah, the possibilities are spreading out, and uh, this should be an extremely interesting century. Yeah, okay, good. That was about as thoughtful as I could have hoped for, so thank you. But <laughs> Floyd, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, the, the scope of what may be possible just broadly in biological science? Uh, I completely concur. I think that, and I think this has been said a, a bunch of times today, I think that we're just scratching the surface. I think the, th the tools that we now have from genomes to, um, I mean, I remember when I started molecular biology, I was trained as a physical chemist, that's why I started molecular biology as a postdoc, and um, everything, you had to make all your own solutions, and so now everything's a kit. So the sort of acceleration that, 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 that sort of technologies have provided just for the day-to-day -day tasks of doing things, it used to be that you, sequencing something would take you know, days, and, and now it's cheap and takes, it, 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 it takes almost no time at all. Um, this, this, this sort of all of this accelerating, all the techniques, the tools, and, and um, it, it's, it's pretty dramatic. So, I mean, I have no idea where things are going to go, but I, I think the tools are um, un, unbelievably powerful. Okay, now, Jim, your company is at a very early stage of doing a whole bunch of stuff. So, when you hear Stuart's, you know, say, I don't really know, it's going <laughs> to yeah. be, it's certainly prom. I mean, what's your sense of yeah. this fundamental question? Yeah, so I, uh, like Stuart, think, I mean, the, the potential is quite, you know, reasonably unlimited, and we're going to see definitely an exponential increase in the adoption and impact that synthetic biology has in multiple fields. But there are really going to be two things that are going to really uh, limit or at least constrain that, that rate of implementation, and the first is recognizing that synthetic biology, this description of technologies that we, we love, is still a tool. It's uh, really not an end in and of itself. It's a tool to solve problems, whether it be to deliver better health care or more, more economical, nutritious food or ultimately fuels or chemicals. And so each one of those industries has its own dynamics and, uh, and infrastructure. So it's, um, I'm going to cite a couple of examples just to show how that plays out from our company but that is clearly going to dictate the implementation rate. And, you know, I think that's what the community saw when there was this sort of boom and bust with respect to biofuels. Uh, there was a, a lot of uh, uh, excitement about the potential, but not really a, a real good grounded understanding of the industry that we're trying to transform. Uh, the second piece is, and I think uh, Floyd was touching on this, and I, I think Drew earlier, um, we're still limited uh, to a great extent by our understanding of the design rules, okay? So we're, we're developing a lot of great tools to do bioprogramming, uh, but we're still uh, at the very, um, just scratching the surface of our understanding of the design rules and basically uh, what to build. So, you know, at our company, we've, we've made a lot of advances in, you know, making DNA and DNA assembly and biological structures uh, faster, cheaper, and more accurately. But still, we're often run into the same issue where, okay, how do we actually design something better than nature has already provided. So uh, to try and uh, uh, bring those two themes together, um, if we look at, at, at our company, uh, our first two uh, commercial, uh, or what we believe will be our first commercial successes, kind of align with those constraints. And the first is on an industrial standpoint. 
Um, uh, two examples, uh, we have a partnership with Novartis Vaccine and Diagnostics where we developed a new method to develop a vaccine seed uh, to start the uh, process for making uh, a seasonal uh, vaccine. Uh, the H7N9 um, uh, virus that uh, in flu that you may have read about that are, arose in China. Uh, uh, the technology and methods that we had developed uh, to replace the sort of egg-based uh, uh, resortant genetic methods to get a starter seed uh, to uh, provide protection, uh, immunization against that strain, uh, we designed that from scratch using only the sequence that was actually transmitted over the internet. And uh, that's what's exciting to show the real first manifestation of sort of digital uh, biology. And the real advantage is that we're able, without having that active virus, be able to uh, develop uh, a vaccine for that and do it in a shorter period of time than previously had been achieved. How short? But uh, uh, six weeks. Right. So that's, uh, you know, that uh, when you're looking at, at uh, a situation where like the uh, previous speaker had alluded to with the H1N1 um, uh, flu in 2009, that you know, may have been a, a real difference maker to, to get out ahead of the curve. And so that's a case where there's already a manufacturing structure and there's information about what we want to build. Okay, we know what the, the virus is, we have its sequence, and now it's a matter of building it. Uh, in our second example, uh, we have a relationship with uh, Archer Daniel Midlands uh, to uh, produce uh, certain nutritional products. And again, in this case, here is uh, an area where we can take all of our technology, what we've learned about making algae uh, better and more efficient, and translate that to solve a, a problem um, and to utilize sort of an existing capital infrastructure. So we didn't have to go out and raise hundreds of millions of dollars to build a new facility, but rather we could drop in a better, you know, a cell line that would produce a product of interest. And so I think this is gonna, um, it, those examples though are real case studies about how this field is evolving where uh, we align recognizing that, you know, we still have limited design knowledge and we have to look at the reality of the industry that we're impacting. But make no mistake, that process will speed up because we have, in each iteration, we're seeing a significant reduction in the time and cost to get to the same endpoint, and that's what's so exciting about this field. And just real quickly, that that Arthur Daniels Mich Mid Midland uh, foodstuff mm -hmm. creation ends mm -hmm. on whatever process really came out of work you were doing with algae with ExxonMobil on uh, fuel production, which was that's, a slower process that is not yet commercial. That's right. right. Uh, so that's that, an interesting. Yeah. So know, it shows how direction. we can, you know, work to tackle the big tough problems, and that's ultimately we're still committed doing that. But we also recognize that we've got to find a path uh, yeah. of our own sustainability. Uh, you know, if we're going to transform the world, we've got to be financially sustainable ourselves. And that was a, a nice way we could uh, really leverage uh, some of the technology we had developed uh, to develop a solution that could have a commercial impact shorter term while continuing to progress the science with respect to the bigger problems. Great. So Stephen, you know, one of the sub-themes of the whole day is technology, IT's role in driving all the rest of this. And your product is a key example of how that's happening. You know, how does Simulia play into this? And how does, you know, generally your, your thinking evolve about where this technology, where technology and IT as a, as a tool set is gonna, how it's gonna drive progress in, in biology and, and what it might imply for where we can go? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, IT is, a, is an underlying uh, enabler for everything we've been talking about today. It's information technology, mm -hmm. right? And that's everything. Biology is all about the information and the nature of life. Uh, and so we have a 30-year history. Um, although we focus <coughs> in the manufacturing sectors historically, mm -hmm. uh, we have a history of basically bringing digital technologies to disrupt markets that haven't really embraced them yet. I mean, we at the Associate Stem. We at the yeah. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, and that's what we do. We look and we, we look at 3D digital technologies and we look at markets that haven't really embraced it yet, but really should. Um, and we try to bring uh, what we've learned from other areas to bear on those markets. 
So we really see um, you know, bioengineering and biology, which we're approaching kind of more from the macro scale top down, because uh, that's kind of where we come from. Uh, so rather than looking at, at the detailed biology inside, we're looking at the end product, uh, which is typically the human body. So we're uh, looking at digitizing uh, and creating digital organs, fully functioning body parts that work on the computer, uh, much like you would manufacture any other device uh, for research purposes or for manufacturing purposes. Uh, if you're building uh, uh, medical devices that you're in, putting in the body, you want a test environment. Well, today, the test environment is typically a human. We call them clinical trials, but really <laughs> humans are being treated as laboratories. They put it in, you function, and people just record how it works. Um, we think that that's a little archaic, and we understand why it happens today, but we think we should commit ourselves to stopping that practice as quickly as possible. So by building these digital organs um, and entire body parts, uh, and ultimately full body, we think we can create digital laboratory. To house all that, you create incredible amounts of data. So you've got to understand not just the data itself, but what it means. And the impact of taking what we learn about creating these body parts and digitizing and storing them in a meaningful way opens up an entire new perspective on managing healthcare and, and health data. Because now if you're understanding how a body is working uh, and you're, you're using tools to diagnose problems, um, you can store that data not just as information uh, or, or numbers, but you can actually store the knowledge of how that, that person is functioning. And then as others have talked about today, you can then start to accumulate that knowledge uh, across populations and more importantly, I think, across someone's lifetime. I think fundamentally, if we can, uh, we go through a lifetime of testing. Each time I go to the doctor, he takes a test and that data goes somewhere. It used to be a piece of paper and now it's a digital version of the piece of paper. Um, but there's no knowledge accumulated. So my healthcare should get better over time. So if we have a working 3D digital model of our own self, it potentially could be stored with restricted access to us just as our DNA would, might be, as, as David Hausler was talking about earlier today. I mean, we might have a really kind of fairly holistic repository of our own health data even beyond what we've conceived of thus far. Right, so you, you, could, you could clearly separate uh, the unique parts that's personal about that healthcare record uh, and the parts that are not so that I could have a, 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 a fingerprint of what my biological system looks like and the treatments and the outcomes without any knowledge of who it was. Uh, so I, I have knowledge of who it was, but it then goes into a central repository uh, that's then available for people to study and say, okay, does my fingerprint look like anyone who's had a fingerprint like that before? Can I learn from those patterns over time? Wow. So I'm gonna to switch to a different topic. You know, it's come up a couple times. I think Nancy set it up nicely. Um, really, the, it, it, in an, I'm not a super, you know, like US uber alles person, but it is interesting <laughs> to look at the state of uh, innovation in this country vis-a-vis uh, -vis others, particularly China, which I happen to get a chance to go to fairly often. And, you know, they know this stuff is important. Let's, like, not pretend they don't. Um, and, and, and we do have a, an enormous opportunity for advance and an enormous feeling of potential resistance from the public, right? I mean, both the, 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 the extinction stuff you're doing, Stuart, and the artificial life, Floyd, that you're developing, you know, any time you talk about it, you have to spend, I haven't forced you to do it yet tonight, but <laughs> you know, you have to spend a considerable amount of time explaining why you believe this is not gonna get out of control and lead to, you know, horrible human catastrophe, the end of the planet or whatever. And, and maybe, and it's not, a, it's not a crazy question either, but I guess it, it, it is a somewhat under-informed question, shall we say, in many cases. And I, the reason I, I, I'm going long-winded, you know, when Beth Seidenberg and I were talking about, we got into this education issue, and you know, it, it, it comes back to so many discussions of US competitiveness. But I'm curious for any of your observations on 
where you think the landscape, the political social landscape in, in the United States in particular, may be headed as the, the pace of biological advance at least potentially accelerates even further. Well, if I could uh, Please, just offer in. a couple comments there. I, I think one of the things uh, we've learned over the last few decades and looked at how uh, genetic um, uh, and genomic technologies have been accepted or not accepted in different um, geographies uh, and in different industries, um, it really comes down to a couple core things. And, and the first is transparency and motivation. And the second is really around benefit. And, uh, you know, this is an, an area where I think uh, the industry collectively has not done as good a job uh, as it can to communicate really the benefits from a societal perspective, whether it's genetically modified crop or, or what have you. Uh, you know, what is that holistic benefit? Why should a consumer care? The cust that is the ultimate yeah. customer. And if there is uh, transparency and good communication about the motives, at least that you, you take the, um, that trust issue, at least reduce it. And I think that's been the, the root of a lot of the acceptance issues. Yeah, um, Th this resonates with something, Stuart, you and I were talking about, that, that, you know, that the biotech industry actually going back as far as Asilomar has been thinking about some of these ethical issues quite methodically but interestingly, there is not a perception that that has been communicated. Yeah. You know, I mean, you made the point that the industry has been surprisingly responsible at internally debating these matters time and time again, right? Uh, and, and yet, I mean, Floyd, I'm eager to hear any of your thoughts you have on this. You know, does, it, do, does the biotech industry or industry broadly that's a potential beneficiary of biotech need to take fundamentally different attitude toward the public in, in communicating benefits? Well, one of the things you want to do is have something that's adorable right at the start. We know that cat videos work. Yes. In vitro fertilization. Yeah. That, there may be an avenue there. I hadn't thought of <laughs> But in vitro fertilization came along as mm -hmm. a possibility uh, some while back. And all of the, you mustn't play God, Stuff came up, all of the, there must be something wrong with the parents that would want such a thing came up. There's certainly gonna be something wrong with the children that would come from that abomination of. This is 20 know, years ago. Yeah, or you know, there's yeah. a way, to, more than that. There's a way to reproduce humans. And then uh, the first in vitro babies came along and they were healthy and they were adorable. And pretty soon they grew up and voted. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> suddenly that whole concern evaporated. So then you could do another kind of socio-cultural economic analysis on what happened with uh, genetically engineered food crops. And you know, the shorthand, whenever I say GMOs are good, the answer to us is Monsanto. Well, what the hell does that have to do with anything? It's like saying Microsoft. It's just a corporation. <laughs> uh, you know, and then you look at the anti-GMO movement, if it's a sin against biology, there must be lots of biologists in it. Well, there's none. Well, if it's a sin against farmers, there must be lots of farmers in it. No, there's only organic farmers who are trying to protect their weird marketing approach to life. So what happened? What happened is, I think you, you named it, 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 you know, the transparency and motivation issues. It looked like it was just for profit, and it was uh, behind a patent wall for a while mm -hmm. of all of this stuff. And so, you know, the sooner you can get this stuff outside of those kinds of packagings, probably the better. And so one of the great attractions, de-extinction, by the way, has not met the kind of anti-GMO freakout. Uh, and I think it's probably because we're transparent. There's no goddamn commercial thing you can do with it. We're <laughs> making sure that you can't. Um, and that, all that helps. So as this, technology becomes less giant corporation. And you know, it's, it's sort of amazing that the medical aspect of this has not been come down on strong because big pharma looks just as bad as Monsanto if you want to look at it that way. <laughs> and patents and trade secrets and all this stuff. But somehow, if the medicine actually works, people will put up with a lot. 
Well, you, you know, it also occurs yeah. to me the biohacker spaces, you know, could play a role. Not we don't want them to be sanitizing the profits of big companies, but on the other hand, as really a, a more egalitarian science emerges, mm -hmm. it could really help. I think so. I don't, any thoughts on this, Floyd? Because I I'm, I'm, I don't want to miss your chance to. Uh, yeah, I mean, you just covered a whole broad range of things. I've, I'll, I'll, I mean, you know, I guess let me say one, one sort of, uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but a sort of dissenting vote from, um, voice from some of what's been talked about today is sort of egalitarian science or dem democratization of science. And this hints at something that Jim said, um, science is hard. And you know, with all the information, all the technology, the genome sequences, and I said that was all revolutionary, all the great things are gonna come, but still it is really hard to actually understand how to do it. Um, biology, I mean, I think as a, as a chemist, and I think, I remember when I was a, a bit younger, um, everyone said, you know, get trained as a chemist and then you can learn to do biology. And what you oh. get from that is chemists who do terrible biology. Yes. Um, <laughs> but biology is, is, a, is, is, is the least reductionist of all the sciences because it's so interconnected and so complex. Right. And, yeah. and that just makes it extremely, you can, you, can, you can write down a very simple piece of paper, you can write down a very simple equation like a physicist would or maybe even a chemist chemist and it just doesn't work and, and you know there's a reason that people go to school and study and get their PhD and where they're focusing on something for five years and really learning how to think about science so I don't I don't want to be overly negative about that and I love the the excitement that this kind of uh, uh, um, public interest brings and it would you know if, if nothing else I think that it, it, it helps to articulate and sort of get people out there who act as um, you know, proponents of science and of, of, of doing good science and of, of, of not being afraid of science. Um, I, and I, I'm not quite as sure um, that, that, that I um, rely on groupthink um, to, to run my, my science. Um, but it certainly is, you know, I, I completely agree that it, it is very important to, 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 to get, to, to demonstrate the utility in something um, because then I think society will adapt to it um, when they when they start to see that it that it's not evil and that and that um, people are, are are benefiting from it. This is another difference between digital code and bio code. Digital code is really easy. Ryan and I, you know, did a hackers conference back in 1984, and there were people who just sort of learned code, and two months later they were creating a significant new tool. Uh, good luck with that with bio coding. It is. Uh, the, the, level, the, the sequence of complicated, incredibly arcane processes that, you know, just to discover them, you've got to find every false lead there is in 14 years, you know, whatever it is, there's <laughs> nothing but false leads out there. Yep. And you go through a zillion failures <laughs> and partial successes that turn out to be blind alleys. It's horrific. And, and can I add one more thing, because it yeah. was related to something that you said earlier about that how, the, um, I think that you used the expression, um, I don't know, patches or something that- Patches and kludges all the way down to a frozen accident. Ex yeah, exactly, <laughs> and, and, and so people think, you know, this sort of notion of Darwinian evolution that everything is adaptive and that everything builds one thing in a very, on, on another in a very logical way. It's, scientists now kind of understand that, or at least think, that's really not the way it works. There's, it's a much more random process. And things that should seem so logical that you should be able to intuit why it functions a certain way, just don't and there's just not that kind of logic underlying, and it's just this weird, what'd you call it, patchwork and quilts? What, what, I guess probably not patchwork and quilts. What was uh, it? Computer patches and kludges. And kludges, right. But this is an important understanding to get widespread. And it is the Yertle the Turtle reference too, is it not? <laughs> <laughs> People think that nature is incredibly fragile and easily broken, we're discovering. Oh my God, what if you put a species out there that nature doesn't know what to do with? Even though it was there for millions of years before we showed up. Nevertheless, they worry about that. And they worry that you know some random gene, a fish gene in a strawberry, will destroy the world. <laughs> and <laughs> one, they imagine that something very fishy is coming with that gene. It's just only a little bit of code that says do this instead of that. It's not a fish. That's part of the misunderstanding. But the other misunderstanding, I think there's a bad seed idea of that there's contagion and that the wrong gene in the wrong place will destroy all life. There's people like Ben and Ashiba who actually say stuff like that. And it, it b is based on thinking that, I guess genomes are rational instead of what Floyd just described. Genomes are garbage and a, a total mess, a very dynamic, fast-moving mess. 
and you know they have one wrong thing go in there, it'll just get absorbed. Uh, there is no one wrong thing you can do to a genome in almost every case. There are very few where one tweak makes a big difference, but it's tiny. People and have those are a lot not of things that Hollywood reproduce. movies is what you're really saying. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, you know, we have, according to this, one minute left. I'll probably exercise my prerogative and go a little longer than that, but I want to hear thoughts from you. I think we've had a pretty damn good conversation up here for the last half hour. Please, Ellen. Okay, get, 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 the, mic, get the mic to Ellen over here uh, real quick, and then we'll go back there. Quickly give her the mic, yeah, and then we'll go to the back next. Uh, okay, uh, on, on three different things that were touched upon just now. Okay, I don't uh, know if three is allowed, but just, okay. give it a start. Really and let's fast. See what happens. Okay, really Squish fast. Them together. Um, I was going to have my picture taken with you, Floyd, because you may not know it, but you're, you are a superstar in the citizen science world. The fact that you had created another base pair buzzed around all of our message boards and everything else. So if nothing and else, now he's dissing you're you getting guys. really <laughs> great PR and you're dissing us. Thank you. So um, the thing about science being really hard, number two, if anyone heard what Drew Endy was saying about abstraction, there's a long game here. There's a game that means to make it more accessible and less hard to engineer. It isn't here yet, and it may take a long time, but it is going to get there. And the third thing, the thing about safety, anything that inherently self-replicates, people are not going to be comfortable with. But the, 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 the thing that keeps coming up over and over again, and even uh, George Whiteside's, I thought he wanted to talk to me about DIY bio. He wanted to talk to me about the risk of DIY bio. <laughs> and I was very disappointed because there's one example they keep bringing up of an immune system gene uh, in a virus or a bacteria that the, I think the Russians did at some point and that made a, a, a tremendous difference um, in, in the pathogenicity. And that same example keeps getting pulled up over and over and over again. So I agree with you, but we have to have a counter message. And I agree that DIY bio is part of it, of course. Okay, I love that there's more a comment than a question, which means we can go to the next one, especially <laughs> unless somebody has a desperate need to respond. Okay, but it was, Really, not, and you got three things in very effectively. Please. <laughs> um, so my name is Megan Palmer. Um, I'm at Stanford at the Center for International Security and Cooperation and uh, work with the Synthetic Biology Engineering Research Center. Um, my question is, what do you guys see as the key decisions we now are facing in terms of how we build the human infrastructure for biotech? What are the what are the key choices in terms of how we cultivate the, the people <laughs> that will be part of the next revolution? Is that an education question? Is it it's not an education. It has to do with some of the comments that uh, Drew Endy was making this morning as well about what types of organizational forms and what are the people that are going to be able to architect this trustful relationship with the public around what biotech can do. Um, is it are, is it the biotech uh, incubators, the DIY biotech, is it companies, is it some sort of other organization that can gather uh, the strategic leadership of the field? Um, what types of people and what types of organizations can do that? That's a challenging question. Who wants to grab it? Well, David, that's your kind of question. Come on, I mean, moderator. Well, I'm supposed Tell to ask something. it. I mean, I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> but I mean, it's really, it's interesting coming from someone at a security related, right. you know. Yeah, we were expecting the usual, where's the bio war going to come No, but I think it's, uh, it, it's very security related, actually. Right. Um, but I think it is. I, I think the short answer is all of the above, right? I think what we're talking about is a total mind shift in how we view uh, biological engineering, not as a threat, mm -hmm. but as a benefit. Um, and that is a systematic yeah. uh, problem that we have to change the thinking of. And I think there's a generation that's growing now that completely embraces innovation and knowledge and information. And I think we need to cultivate that yeah. beyond just playing games, but actually using it yes. to improve the world. And, and Steve, to that point, I mean, if you look at culturally, at least what I, I see in, in the, my daughter and, and the kids uh, 
uh, she's going to school with is, is there two things. One, they are, I would say, much more um, interdisciplinary and open to ideas from all different sources, non-traditional learning, and not thinking about things in, in such re regimented ways. And secondly, they're very communicative, more, probably more so than you'd, than you'd, you'd want, but uh, that actually does seed, uh, that actually seeds some good things when you're looking at trying to improve um, uh, communication to the general public about articulating benefits of technology and what problems it can solve and the, the actual measures that are being taken by a lot of groups to ensure that it's being done in a safe uh, and sound manner. So I think those are, are elements that can be built on what the right organization uh, or organizational structures uh, is, a, is a, a probably a question for others, but I think those are some good seeds to build on. I think some right things have been done in context of sort of biosecurity and organization Back in the late 70s, early 80s, when hackers were first happening, computer hackers were first happening, the FBI came down on them heavy and put some like Captain Crunch in jail and so on. <laughs> and that's not happening with biohackers. And indeed, the FBI, instead of coming on with total angry ignorance, like they did with the computer hackers back when, are coming in with quite a lot of sophisticated knowledge and openness and curiosity to the IGEM yeah, jamboree, and, Ellen, yeah. and there's she probably some uh, guys here like that. Yeah. Uh, are there any FBI people here? You can say, <laughs> NSA you can't say, but the FBI you can say. <laughs> anyway, yeah. uh, they are showing learn up to, at gatherings like this it. and passing out their card, which says, you know, weapons of mass destruction, FBI zone, so. Because <laughs> they know that the That's practitioners, true. as was the case with the computer hackers, are the ones that know where the actual potential bad news is coming. They are the outliers who are trying stuff and hearing stuff and ever more communicating stuff globally. And if something weird turns up, they will be the first to know. And for a change, the government, at least the US government, I hope other governments are saying, um, we're not gonna hurt you. Uh, we know you don't wanna hurt the world. We would like to help you in that motivation and uh, make sure that this wonderful technology that you love and we love doesn't hurt people. And so there is this relationship between the establishment, the government, the big, slow, grinding, decades behind government, actually staying pretty current. And yeah, Drew, but Drew you know, and, Stuart, and, I gotta say, that's out of, so much of that is driven by this excess reaction to terrorism and this a fear mentality, which is what has got the government focused on this, oh. as opposed to, you know, what they might be doing in China, where they say, our country is going to, in the next five years, develop 15 or 20 of these new labs, and we're going to train 75,000 scientists. And, you know, that's not what we are doing. Our government is not taking that. I mean, it's true. They're, they're, maybe they're curious. They're, they maybe are trusting of some people in this room. And, but I don't know. I can't be quite as excited about it as you are. Do you think the government's screwing up? So is what? Screwing up, the government Well, is. I think that, well, the, the, I just don't think you should give any, the government any more credit for, <laughs> for, for, for continuing to think that terrorism is the only thing they need to worry about, which I'm afraid is way too often uh, the case in, in a lot of government Well, behavior. there's bioterror and bioerror. And bioerror can be, you know, even worse because nobody sees it coming. It just turns out to be there's something that got out of the lab we, you know, we spend a lot of efforts to make sure they don't get out of the lab, they get out of the lab, and it's a problem. We don't know what it might be, but, you know, after the fact, it'd be hard to undo, unless you have a lot of people paying attention to bad news that shows up. Yeah. I'm not saying we don't need to combat the evil that was mentioned earlier. Did you have something you were making interesting facial expressions? No, I'm just listening. Okay. <laughs> uh, we, I, I am going to get in trouble with some of my colleagues if I don't wrap it soon, but there are a lot of hands, so, okay. Does anybody actually have the mic? Okay, yeah. I've got a mic. Uh, my name is Robin Chu, and I, I'm a candidate for Congress, and so uh, it's very interesting some of the questions you guys have been asking, and I've got 50 million uh, ideas running around in my head, but what we face in politics is this whole idea of disinformation and how people use fear factors as a way to motivate people's political behavior. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is 
uh, ideally made for the, uh, the uh, conspiracy theorists out there that are concerned with how synthetic biology is going to destroy human life. Uh, uh, I'm a Republican, and it's especially almost epidemic in Republican circles that uh, they use fear. And I'm just wondering how, as a politician, uh, we can make rational arguments about the kinds of things that you're talking about, which are game-changing in a positive way uh, to make all our lives better. It's really hard to do in politics. Fear is a much more effective political tool. That's a n very, another Ask version Barlow. of the same question she asked. But get, get Barlow to respond mm. to that one. He's a Republican again. Okay, you know, Barlow was, we, I didn't know Barlow was here until about 10 minutes ago, so he should grab the mic since he was originally going to be on this panel. Well, you know, you're absolutely right. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I also want to want to say that I agree very much with Stuart about how, how encouraging it is that the government hasn't jumped on on desktop uh, bioterror uh, as, as the, the, the next tool of the bad guys. But I mean, actually, I, I believe that you're right, David. The real problem, the, the, the terrifying problem to me, is that the government isn't taking this stuff seriously at all. And it takes a long time to develop. I mean, a, as somebody who is doing a biofuel that I, I think is actually going to make it, uh, but it has to make it in a time frame that is much different from anything you can do with bits. It would be great to have actual government assistance that was meaningful and wasn't just sort of uh, nest feathering on the part of the DOE and the consultancies that form in the immediate vicinity of the DOE. So, it, you know, there's, there's a lot that the government can be doing with biology that's positive that they're not doing. So, yeah, I'm glad they're not they're not completely freaking out in the way that, you know, when, when, when EFF got started, the Electronic Frontier Foundation got started, it was because they were, uh, <laughs> I had a visit from the FBI where I had to spend two hours with the guy explaining to him what the crime was before, before I could start telling him why I wasn't the guy that had done it. <laughs> you, know, and, you know, that stuff is really kind of scary. You get that many well-armed, insecure guys wandering around someplace they don't understand. <laughs> Uh, and, and there is room for, for fear in the general vicinity of, of uh, bad bugs. But as you say, bad bugs, Stuart, are not that easy to, to make. And we need to... We need good to, bugs are hard enough. Yeah, I know. And we, we, need to, we need to be able to make good bugs and, and get some government help in doing uh, the good bug making. All right. I well, okay, okay, okay. We've got a desperately waving a hand over here, and this is going to have to be the last comment or question, I'm, I'm afraid. Perfect. This one involves the audience. Uh, my name is Tito Jankowski. I'm one of the co-founders of BioCurious, and my question for you guys up on the stage, as well as everybody else, is have you been to a biotech lab before in your life? Whether it was high school or a community biohacker lab, everybody raise your hand. Maybe we'll redo this next year. <laughs> What does that look like? 80 <laughs> well, You don't raise your hand for it. Yeah. And then one more is, how many of you ever transformed a bacteria? So that means <coughs> DNA and putting it in E. coli or something else. Okay, so two up on stage and 50% in the crowd. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> Do you understand why? <laughs> Okay. okay, you're just Thank doing you a research study. Okay. okay. Um, we like that. Oh, my God. Okay. Simone, can I ask this? Let this guy. Okay. Simone is my boss here. So, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to pick up on something that Steve Jurvetson said. Uh, information economies tend towards pol income polarization unless we innovate for inclusion. So, the question would be is there something we can do uh, to use synthetic biology to produce extremely affordable products for people in shanty towns in Johannesburg or Rio de Janeiro? I think you should repeat. Did anybody? Yeah, I didn't it, quite it, get that. I'm afraid through the accent. Fuzzy. You might have to repeat that again a little more slowly. The question is, can we produce extremely affordable products for people in shanty towns leveraging synthetic biology, for example, with biomaterials to produce houses or to produce extremely affordable food for people in shanty towns. Because if we can do that, we can use innovation to bring to create inclusion. So can we really use some of these tools to build products that really help the very poor, it, I suppose, globally is what you're really referring to. Yeah, I mean, 
Okay, that's the question. Yes. Next question. <laughs> So there, somebody said mo modified bananas have been shown they can help prove. You ever heard of penicillin? Blindness. Yeah. 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 Flood proof rice. Yeah, it's yeah. out there. Yeah. Golden rice yeah. for sure. Yes. Yeah, I think that's so. Yes, and, and that rice is now controversial. But anyway. Um, <laughs> um, or no. But you can do it. That's but you can, well, it did. It certainly changed the world. We know that. Uh, mm -hmm. I really have to, I thank the panel, we gotta wrap. This is great, this was a, a wonderful discussion and I thank you all for participating in it. I thank Barlow for being a spiritual participant. Um, <laughs> and um, so uh, basically this is the end of, a, of what I think would turned out to be a, a great day. It's in our opinion, it's the beginning of at least an annual thing, maybe more often. We hope that you all will give us your ideas about people we should include, ways we should proceed, uh, companies, uh, ideas of topics, themes, whatever. We're really open to your input, so please give it to me or other members of the team who are around. Um, I want to really thank Dassault System, represented on stage, and also, you know, the, the heart out there is an example of what he was talking about before, so you really should check that out on your way out if you haven't already. McKinsey and Company, Scientific American, the Bay Area Council, Calabria, and Startup Product Academy all helped make today's possible. So uh, thank you so much. We have a reception now, and uh, we will see you there and, and again next year. So be there. Thank you, David.